Julie graduated with first class honours and a university medal from the ANU School of Art Painting Workshop in 2008 and completed a practice-led visual arts PhD in 2013, for which she was awarded the J.G. Crawford Medal. But as a former research scientist, her, her um, research crosses across that of science and visual arts. And um, she says she talks fast, so you don't have to. <laughs> Please uh, welcome Julie. Thank you. Thank you. So you might get an early tea break. All right. Uh, so as Barb said, I, graduate, I graduated from um, my PhD uh, about 18 months, nearly two years ago. Most of my life I've been a research scientist in the area of biomedical research and biochemistry. Um, but when I made that switch to the visual arts, which was about 10 years ago, I didn't really see any interconnection between those two fields. And so I guess I'm going to focus on painting in this talk, but I'm also going to talk about sort of how I started to see similarities and differences between my practice. So. Before the PhD, before I started my PhD, I was a representational observational painter. So the image on the left is an eye painted into the bowl of a spoon. So it's a really tiny painting, and I made lots like this. It's quite extraordinary for me to see it blown up at this enormous scale. Uh, so my focus was on spatial illusion and how I could evoke the convex surface of the eye from the concave surface of the spoon. The central image is from around the middle of my PhD, and the one on the right is a painting made a couple of weeks ago, which emerged from my residency in applied mathematics. And this progression is essentially the story that I'm going to talk about today, focusing on painting, or at least one strand of my painting practice. So I didn't really mean to become an abstract painter. I was going to focus on realistic representational painting in my PhD, and so my PhD proposal was full of, account, of, full of accounts of all the um, surrealist, photorealistic paintings that I was going to make. But within a few days of starting, I was drawing grids with a ruler, colouring in, them in with pencils, and I didn't know why. Um, I made about 50 of them very rapidly within a couple of weeks, all based on the same pleated form. And I really had no idea what I was doing. And that's because a great day in the studio is when you walk in in the morning and out again at night and you can't remember what you've been doing. But practice-led research involves understanding and explaining that process. As Russ Gibson wrote in his essay, The Known World, scholarly research involves two modes of cognition that are consciously distinct, one immersive and the other analytical, and both are central to the process. And he talks about visual arts and uh, scientific research. He describes this shift between the two states as, in, as an intelligent shimmer. So given this, I wondered, how I could record and understand what happens in the studio without disrupting the intuitive painting process. And it feels like a bit of a cheat putting a research question in at, at this point, because as we've heard uh, sort of articulated today in particular, I think, although questions drive practice, um, they don't usually get articulated until much further on in the process. And certainly it wasn't until the last three months of my PhD when I was writing my exegesis that I suddenly thought, this is why I was doing what I was doing. And that was one of my questions. So I'm going to focus on that aspect of my practice now. As I made these, I numbered them, and I realized I could hang them as a kind of family tree. Um, so this shows 12 of those 50 drawings arranged in this way in the order that they were made. So the row across the middle uh, shows the basic image de developing in complexity as it moves from left to right. And those arranged vertically and horizontally, sorry, vertically in either direction are the images that develop from them. So I could see new forms developing. And as each image represents a shift in my thinking about color and form, I could see my decision-making process and, tra um, and track its evolution. As the British op artist Bridget Riley said, you can't deal with thought directly outside practice as a painter. Doing is essential in order to find out what form your thought takes. She refers to this as turning a blind intuition into a conscious intuition. So without really planning to, I felt I'd established an experimental system that would allow me to develop ideas in the studio and also to discover, in Riley's words, what form my thoughts were taking. Which perhaps sounds a little grandiose, because these are early experiments and they're not works that I've ever exhibited. But they did, what they did allow me to do was to establish a methodology that I've used ever since. So having organized my work in this way, what did I learn? First, that I could select easily which works I felt most drawn to, those that perhaps suggested future directions. So for example, 
the early drawing on the left I felt was too simple, while the one on the right is so fragmented that it doesn't really hang together as a coherent form. However, I felt that the central drawings were potentially interesting. They read as objects and are also visually ambiguous. And paired in this way, they perhaps imply a sense of shifting from one configuration to another. So I could start to understand what I'd been aiming for and where my project was going. I seemed to be interested in creating forms that were ambiguous and perhaps dynamic. I realised, too, that I hadn't altogether abandoned representational painting, but rather was exploring representational techniques, colour, form, tone, but without reference to real objects. I could see that my subject was still spatial illusion, how paint can open up the picture plane to create that sense of a third dimension. But by separating illusionistic techniques from recognisable objects, I could focus instead on their formal compositional qualities and also play with the idea of visual ambiguity. So there's an example of that here in this painting by Hieronymus Bosch, The Ascent of the Blessed, where the light bright circle can be a tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel, but it can also be read as a highlight on a solid object that appears to emerge from the painting surface. So you may be able to sort of flip it with your eyes so it looks as if it's protruding out down to the left and then flip it back again. But this ambiguity is collapsed by the human forms that we interpret as being near or far from us, particularly the tiny figure painted onto the light circle, um, which then clearly becomes an exit into the sunlit plains of paradise. In other words, the figurative nature of the, of the work shuts down an alternative, plausible interpretation. So this form is what's known as a bistable percept, and this is another. Um, so as you stare at this very familiar network of lines, what you're probably seeing is a cube that points down and to the left. But if you keep staring at it, it should flip. Is anybody getting that? Yep. So, and you're not thinking about it. It just just happens. So you're probably looking up at a point uh, at a cube that um, points off to the right, and you can use that red dot to sort of push and pull it and exercise your vision centre to flip it between the two orientations. So these alternative interpretations are what the neuropsychologist Richard Gregory calls visual hypotheses. And in fact, what you're doing when you do that is picking only two of many possible interpretations, but we go for the simplest. And of course, this also applies to optical illusions like the duck rabbit and so on. So as I said, I used to be a research scientist, and I realised that my fascination with this kind of visual ambu ambiguity related to a particular aspect of my scientific past, which was the development of hypo hypotheses. So as a scientist, I performed experiments, analysed data, and then speculated as to what these might mean. I developed multiple hypotheses that seemed likely to account for my experimental results, but which couldn't all be true. And this was what I really enjoyed about research science. So hypothetical thought creates a kind of crystallised uncertainty, where reality fragments into many possible but mutually exclusive futures. So the next step as a scientist in this process is to try to disprove the most plausible hypothesis. And this was always the hardest part, when I saw my carefully constructed speculations come crashing down. So I started to consider how my visually ambiguous images might represent this open, speculative form of thought. Could I manipulate colour and form to balance visual ambiguities and make images where alternative interpretations remain open and unresolved? And so this raised another question for me, because I could see, too, that this might provide a way of thinking about the nature of visual arts research and how it might be similar to and different from scientific research. Perhaps I could approach this not in a general way, but through my own experience of laboratory and studio practice, and this is something that I'll come back to later. But this analysis also led me to a further question, or really it's more accurately an anxiety that underlay the whole of my PhD, which was, you know, what I love about painting is its ability to convey emotion, its effective quality, and I was really concerned that my approach to painting was too clinical, too analytical. You know, was I a real painter or was I just a scientist pretending to be a painter? However, this process of analysis meant that I could return to the studio with a clearer sense of what was driving my practice, which was to explore the potential of ambiguous geometric forms to visualise hypothetical thought. So in these watercolour paintings, each concentric ring is broken up into triangles, providing a more complex structure to work with, and so more opportunities to introduce conflicting visual information. I use the complementary contrast of blue and a warm brown over their full tonal range, working from the darkest shades through to the white of the paper. But the result was these, which seemed very flat. But when I abandoned symmetry and threw them into an eccentric conformation, I hoped that this would convey more of a sense of movement. So having reached this point of purely doing um, practicing in my studio, I knew I needed to find a context for my work to find out how others had attempted this visualisation of thought. 
So I explored many avenues, including scientific diagrams, memory training systems such as the Memory Palace, classic and medieval conceptions of the mind, op art, the work of Dorian Reed Nakamura and of geometric artists Deborah Dawes and Kerry Polinets have also been key to my research. However, I'm going to focus on just two areas, uh, which is Latin American concrete art and the logic diagram. So at this point in my research, I simply Googled the words visual idea because that was how I was thinking of my paintings and I thought, I'll just see what Google Images throws up. And I found Brazilian artist Voldemar Cordero's 1956 painting of that name with which I instantly fell in love. So it led me into the world of Latin American concrete art and it also took me to Madrid for my field studies in 2011 to this survey exhibition and the cord oh sorry, I think I skipped it, sorry, I'll skip it slide. There we go. So the Cordero paintings there in the background. And one of the amazing things about seeing these works is that digitally they look incredibly precise. They often look as if they could be computer generated, but it's such a different experience when you walk into a room and, and look around and you can see the brush marks and you can see the little marks that people have made to measure up the compositions and they immediately become much more human in their presence. And concrete art images are built up using line, geometric forms and colour. So it was first formulated by the Dutch artist Theo van Dersberg and in his 1930s manifesto, he described it as being scientifically objective and a manifestation of precise mathematical thought. The artist, according to van Dersberg, should avoid any reference to nature, sentiment, or sensuality. So in a way, this connection was exactly what I was looking for because it referred to thought, but on the other hand, it was so cold, so clinical, um, that it really just enhanced my anxiety about working in this particular way. Because I really love geometric art, and my response to it isn't intellectual or not purely intellectual, it makes me think and feel, and I don't separate out those two reactions. But concrete art was reimagined in 1950s Latin America. Cordero was part of the Brazilian neo-concrete movement that also included Elio Atishka and Vigia Clark, whose work is pictured here, as well as many others. So these artists acknowledged the mathematical aspects of their work, but explicitly reframed it as an imaginative, intuitive process, emphasizing the idea of sensibel, which I've probably mispronounced, but which means sensuality, the involvement of the body as well as the mind. As Lydia Clark wrote, their work was intended not for a machine eye, but for a body eye. So the composition of Cordero's painting is organized according to a mathematical formula, in fact, the golden ratio that we've heard a bit about over the last couple of days. There's an internal logic to the work, it's a visual expression of the thinking process that generated it, but it isn't purely a mathematical diagram. Cordero wrote that art is different from pure thought because it is material, and from ordinary things because it's thought. In other words, he positions the painting as a manifestation of thought that transcends its mathematical origins because of its material, physical presence. Similarly, Ligia Clark's Bichos, or Beast, is a geometric form, but it's meant to be held and manipulated into the hands moved into new conformations. Thus engaging the body and the mind, the viewer becomes an active participant in the work. While Elio Atishka's Metaschema, which translates as meta-scheme, or you know, a scheme that's representing a scheme or analyzing a scheme, it's one of 350 related gouache paintings on paper made in just two years. Um, so according to curator Lynn Zelovansky, Atishka compulsively categorized and ordered every facet of his creativity clearly numbering his works according to the class and subclass of objects to which they belonged, and I found this obsessive approach enormously reassuring. <laughs> um, so looking at the work of these and other artists helped to allay my anxieties about taking a scientific approach to visual arts research. It provided a broader context for an investigation that could be scientific without ruling out the em emotive, but effective potential of painting. So moving on to logic diagrams. This is from an early 14th century book by the mystic Raymond Lull, it's a kind of machine for thinking. So the diagram's divided into 16 sections, and around the perimeter are Latin words. Lull was a religious mystic, and these all relate to the quali qualities of the divine, such as bonum, meaning good, magnum, great, eternum, eternal, and so on. So those lines in the center indicate what the practitioner is supposed to do, which is to con connect words to make short phrases. So we can follow the line from bonum to magnus, which gives us his goodness is great, and also his greatness is good. So this system can generate 240 possible phrases, and the user of the diagram is meant to contemplate the specific meaning of each. As the mathematician Clifford Bickover writes, Lull believed that by using his wheels to produce all combinations of principles, one explores all possible structures of truth and obtains universal knowledge, which I found intriguing. 
So this diagram activates is an, and is activated by the viewer's mind. And here I think there are connections to Ligia Clark's work to those manipulable metal structures. The line itself is a creative link between concepts, indicating the generation of a new idea. And I'm attracted too to that optical shimmer, the cross-hatching that creates an almost three-dimensional effect. And this shimmer embodies the activity of those lines, those connections that represent a living, active, thinking process. And I connect this back to Ross, Dis Ross Gibson's description of the shift between immersive and analytical thought that's necessary to re practice led research as an intelligent shimmer. So Lull's exhaustively thorough permutation of elements brought to mind the work of American conceptual artist Sol LeWitt. For example, all single, double, triple, and quadruple combinations of lines in four directions, one, two, three, and four part combinations, in part because of the shimmer of those cross hatchings, but, but mainly because it's an expansion of that title into, you know, it sort of shows the quantity of information that's contained within a simple instruction. So following Lull's strategy, I made my own logic diagram, identifying eight terms relevant to LeWitt's work, derived from his sentences and paragraphs on conceptual art, which were in the writings of Lucy Lippard and Rosalind Krauss and my own observations. So I made a paper version of this with turning disks, so each of those disks would turn independently so you could make new sentences. And I did this when I had to write a 5,000 word essay as part of my PhD, because this can generate 1,680 possible six word sentences, <laughs> giving 10,008 words of original text, which is enough for two essays. <laughs> Though I did also have to write the essay as well. So examples include, its futile logic is irrationally fertile, its irrational multiplicity is structurally open, its structured repetition is openly futile, and so on. So following Lowell's logic, each of these sentences could be contemplated to reveal some aspect of Lewitt's work that one might otherwise miss. So my aim here was to question how interesting or creative this might be. What are the possibilities and limitations of such a system? While every sentence is unique, it's clearly limited in its scope. After all, the diagram generates phrases such as, it's logical logic, it's logically logical. Furthermore, the number of com combinations generated will always be finite, no matter how complex the diagram. And I just included this quotation from, um, this is from Gulliver's Travels, when Gulliver goes to the Isle of Laputa and visit, visits the students of logic. So the most ignorant person may write books in philosophy, poetry, mathematics without the least, least assistance from genius or study. And I guess that's one of the concerns I had about my particular approach to visual arts. So it raised this question, which is, can, this can such an exhaustive process generate new ideas or will it simply reconfigure information into predictable and finite patterns? Is this a creative process or an exercise of futility? So this was a question that I could take into the studio. And again, it it's a question of identifying after the fact that this was my motivation for making this series of work entitled Strange Objects. So my aim here, or at least what I ended up doing, was that I worked within certain limits to make an extended series of geometric and visually ambiguous paintings. I wanted to find out what would happen if I just kept making paintings. Would they evolve? Would they break out of the system? Or would I end up in a futile cycle, making works that were virtually identical? So every one of the 50 or so gouache paintings in this series is on square black paper. And for all but three, I used the same size circular grid, the circle being a reference to the logic diagram. I used a limited palette of colors, and I worked on this series pretty obsessively for about six weeks, making no other paintings. So as I worked, I hung them on my studio wall, starting in the top left and moving down and up as I went along. And to create spatial illusions, um, I diluted out the gouache. And this also gave the paintings a physical material quality when seen close up. So my color choices allowed me to play with the eye-catching qualities of red against a cool blue, with a pale warm yellow operating as a highlight. The red and blue tend to fight for attention. We perceive red as advancing and blue tends to recede. However, pale colors also advance while darker hues tend to be read as recessive shadows. So this was a color palette that could be open to conflicting readings and it tends to operate differently at different viewing distances as well, which if you make small work is, is something that I'm always thinking about. What does the work do from far away from a mid-ground and then from close up? So as I worked through this system, I hope videos are showing up. Um, I found myself getting stuck on particular effects that I enjoyed. For example, here I experimented with filling in the grid and then breaking down the edge and with introducing that deep cadmium red. And here I was working out how I could enhance the shimmering effect at the centre as an indirect reference to the optical shimmer at the centre of the Lullian logic diagram. So as the series developed, four main families evolved. 
two I've already shown you, and there are two others. So one's the top right-hand one, where the images started to resemble natural shell-like forms, and then the bottom left, um, wave interference patterns. And so I was interested in the way that starting off with pure mathematical forms and principles, I was starting to perhaps make things that look like objects in the real world, natural forms. But within each family, over time, the paintings tended to converge to become increasingly similar to those that had gone before, and I found myself becoming very bored and frustrated. And one day, this frustration led me to um, discard the constraining circular grid and to allow the pyramidal unit to guide the composition of the image. So just returning to that question as to whether an exhaustive process can generate new ideas or simply reconfigure information, with that series, The Strange Objects, I found that at first the images tended to be quite diverse, but then they stopped evolving, as I've described. However, this, this stagnation led to an unplanned and marked change in my approach to the image. So the answer to the question isn't straightforward. Such a process could both become predictable, and then because of this, it might lead me somewhere new. So removing the grid meant that I no longer pre-planned the form of each image, or sorry, so in those earlier ones. There's no drawing or gridding involved. I started out by painting a single unit and then another, joining them on, allowing the form to develop, creating asymmetric and crystalline forms. So I set up a simple relationship between tonality and the size of the basic unit. So smaller units are dark, larger ones are pale, and often quite transparent, so the red ground comes through. This enhances the spatial illusion as the larger and lighter units appear to grow and swell out of the surface. But when I tried to constrain the unit to keep it small and regular, the image still diverged from a regular appearance because of all those small slippages that happen when you're painting. I could also allow the spacing between the units to grow, creating a more organic line that zigzags across the paper, disrupting the form. So I made connections here with this medieval painting um, the Errant Spirit. It's the only surviving panel of a disciplinary diptych or triptych, and a missing panel or panels would have shown a man at prayer with images suited to his religious devotion. However, here his errant thoughts are straying to worldly concerns in the form of red lines. I'm not sure if you can see those, but they're emanating across the painting. They snake across the painting, branching out towards the horse, clothing, caskets of jewels, and under the skirt of the young and beautiful woman. So I like the connections this makes between thought reverie, imagination, and the sensual experiences of the body. There are lines of thought, too, in the work of Venezuelan concrete artist Gertrude Goldschmidt, known throughout her life as Gago. These are drawings in space made with wire. The beautiful interconnectedness of these delicate forms emerges from a simple structure, a linkage between two points, and is taken to an extreme in the reticular area on the right, which fills a whole gallery in Caracas, which I would just love to see. So this highly complex and organic form brings to mind the micro and macroscopic structures of the universe. And in a series of poetic writings found after her death, her sabiduras, or words of wisdom, Gago described the nature of this line from which her structures are formed. Just to paraphrase, the line is abstract and material at the same time, embodying human descriptive thought and human connection. So as in the Lullium diagram, the line represents thought, but for Gago, it's cellular, molecular, human, and also a-natural, outside nature, involving the intellect, the body, the senses, and the imagination. And these paradoxes aren't resolved, they're held open in these beautiful forms. And I was lucky enough to see some of the spheres in the really wonderful survey exhibition of her work at the Henry Moore Institute in England last year. So in this context, I began to feel that how constraining the edge of the paper support was. So instead of allowing it to truncate and constrain the growth of the image as it does here, I began adding more paper as the image grew and spread, resulting in this more amorphous and somewhat anatomical form. And then this was the largest work that I made, um, where the final constraint was the size of my studio floor. So the work measures around two and a half by a little over three meters. So at this scale, I felt I was no longer in control of the work, because unlike the smaller works where I could get the whole painting in my visual field, with this I might be working on one part, but then something strange would be happening when I went off to work on another part of the painting. But instead I felt I was cooperating with the image as it negotiated the surface of the paper. So this work has its origins in the mathematical ideas and simple forms described earlier, but it's also a record of a physical, mental and emotional process. For me, it records the highs and lows of the last week before my final exhibition, when I worked day and night with no idea of what this painting would look like, whether it would even be finished, or what that even meant. It brings back the experience of working on my studio floor, the aches and pains, my sore knees, a mixture, a mixture of anxiety and elation that is the PhD student's lot. 
So reflecting again on the question of scientific and visual arts research, the most compelling difference, and that's just a picture from my exhibition, the most compelling, compelling difference that I experience is that a painter, I operate within a broader and far more diverse context than I did as a scientist. I'm continually coordinating and negotiating a wide range of influences. So this negotiation occurs in the studio when I'm immersed in the painting and drawing process and I feel it to be present in the twisting cellular structure of this work. Throughout my project, Raymond Lowell's logic diagram provided a model for this negotiation, the shimmering lines representing, as they do, an accumulation of individual associations between ideas, has helped me to visualise the complexities of practice-led research. So this idea of shimmer representing active thinking is something I've explored further in some recent paintings that emerged from my 2014 residency. Is that the five minutes? Great, excellent, thank you. Um, so this is a scheme, it's called the Vice Chancellor's College Artist Fellowship Scheme that I co-developed um, a couple of years ago, three years ago, with our then Professor of Practice-Led Research, Anthea Callum. So when I was halfway through my PhD, I was sort of musing on what would happen afterwards, and this is one of the clear differences between arts and sciences, in that science, you always go on to a postdoc after a scientific PhD. But as a visual artist, I was wondering what my fate would be, um, what would I be doing? And so I sort of, we developed this scheme that places a School of Art graduate in each of the colleges, of which there are seven at the ANU, so that's the College of Law, the College of Business and Economics, um, Research uh, Biology and the Environment and so on. And the aim of this was in part to support graduates who are coming out of the School of Art, to give them some financial support, to create interdisciplinary or perhaps collaborative projects that might have a longer life and perhaps have some sort of publication or funding opportunities attached. And also to let people in other parts of the university understand what it is that we do at the art school, because we always feel as if we're the poor cousins um, at the ANU, particularly with an engineer for a vice chancellor. However, our vice chancellor, Ian Young, so we named the scheme after the vice chancellor, and then he was sort of, he kind of had to agree to fund it, and he, <laughs> we have an exhibition each year that shows the work of the previous year's um, uh, fellows, and he trots along and gives a very nice speech about how important the research we do at the School of Art is, and so then everybody gets to hear it, and it's, um, it's, it's a good experience. So I worked in applied maths with um, two topologists, uh, Dr. Vanessa Robbins and Professor Stephen Hyde, and I'm not going to go into the mathematics of the schemes that I was looking at, but my particular interest was the idea of visualisation and understanding, because I know that my understanding of complex maths falls down when I can't visualise the system that's being explained to me. So... My rough, broad aim of the project was to understand how mathematicians visualise their systems, what kind of visual imagery they used, whilst trying at the same time not to be seduced by those very beautiful images and not simply reproduce them. And so what I wanted to do was to understand a particular system, and the one that I worked on was a structure called the Entangled Labyrinth, which is just a beautiful name. But then to find my own way of understanding, visualising that system, and then to work through it and um, create my own idea. And so I'm not going to explain that in detail, but what I started to do was to use colour to map space, uh, which was not something that the mathematicians were doing. And so that's resulted in this series of works. Perhaps paradoxically, this opportunity to work in a scientific environment and to explore the nature of mathematical imagery has led me to refocus on the physical material for its particularities of painting and to refocus, too, on the differences that I perceive between scientific and visual arts research rather than the similarities, which leads me to my final point. In my scientific practice, no matter how intuitive or serendipitous the process might be, it was crucial that I formulate precise and unambiguous answers to research questions. These are the foundations on which scientific research is built. But I don't have definitive answers to the questions that I've posed throughout this talk. I didn't really even have the questions as I went along, nor do I think that it would be useful if I did. Instead, I feel that what I've done is to explore, react to, reformulate, and I hope visualise these questions in my painting practice, keeping them open to be considered by the viewer. Thank you. <laughs>